Welcome to another episode of Captured Killers. My name is Kim, and if you're interested in true crime like I am, please hit that subscribe button. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps me out. Today's comment or question of the day, and this is going to be different about this series, is I'm always going to include a comment, a suggestion, an update from the last video that I did, which I compared for serial killers, their profiles. And this is from Olivia Ramirez. Hi, Olivia. I'm gonna love this series. I like watching true crime shows. Thanks, Olivia, for your comment, and I hope you like this series. So let's get right into the video. Today, we're going to be talking about Gary Leon Ridgway also known as the Green River Killer. Gary Ridgway was born February 18th, 1949. He was born to his parents, Mary Ridgway and Thomas Ridgway. He was one of three boys. Gary lived in the Seattle, Washington area. Gary's relationship with his parents was not the greatest. Dad was a mortuary worker and he would talk to Gary about his co-workers performing necrophilia on the corpses. Whether or not this was an impact on Gary, but it is interesting that later in, in life for Gary, this was something that he he did. His mother was known to be, to Gary in his own words, a sexual figure. She took pride in her appearance and because Gary was such of a bedwetter, I talked about this in my other episode, but Gary was such of a bedwetter that his mom would immediately put him in the bathtub and then she would clean him and then clean his genital area in a way that would arouse him and then would make fun of him for this. And so Gary just really had some confusion going on. He hated his mother, but he wanted to have sex with his mother. Later in life, he said that he thought about killing her and defiling her beauty because she was so beautiful that he wanted to take that away from her, quote, ruin her. His, needless to say, his relationship with his parents was not a healthy relationship at all. And in school, Gary had a low IQ at 82 and he struggled. And with having a low IQ and repeating grades, he just never felt successful. And his mother would remind him of how he wasn't successful. He was good for nothing. And this really did play a huge part uh, for Gary. Gary was a, a religious man. Sorry if you hear the sirens, it's so loud here. Gary was a religious man, I guess. He felt like as long as he confessed his sins that he would be forgiven. I don't think that's how it works, Gary. One thing that he had, you know, had said. But in the same breath, he would say stuff like, killing his victims is how he controlled the bitches. That gives you a glimpse into Gary's mind. Very disturbed and actually you probably don't even want uh, that glimpse. So Gary, in this interview that I watched, it's on Amazon Prime and it's a uh, Gary Ridgway, the mind of a monster, I believe is what it's called. And that has a lot of information. It just really is disturbing almost. It's not gruesome, but it is very much very detailed. And it had a lot of interviews with Gary. So if you're interested, I would check it out. Um, it's a rental, I think it's like $2.99 or something, but it is very interesting. And it's where I got a lot of my information. Gary's first victim, was Wendy Caulfield. She was only 16 years old. Gary pulled up, she was a sex worker. He pulled up, asked her if she was, quote, dating. And unfortunately, she said, yes, I'll date you. Wendy was never seen again. Gary's victims were typically teenagers, early 20s, very young, taken way too early. So not too long after Wendy, five more bodies were found. This was August 1982. And these were the bodies of Deborah Bonner, 23 years old, Marsh, 31, Cynthia Hines, 
17 years old, and the fifth victim being Opal Mills, who was only 16 years old. These bodies were all, all found in the Green River. Gary had uh, almost been seen by a fisherman. He was coming around the corner, so Gary ran and he went and hid and just left the body on the side of the river, wasn't able to put her in the body of water like he intended to do because he got scared. He had placed rocks uh, in two of the victims in their vagina. This later helped the police later, but very disturbing that he did that. He did some strange things along the way like most serial killers do, but that was the earlier victims where he had placed rocks in the vagina of a couple of his victims. One other thing that I should mention about Gary when he was a child he also was known to be very cruel with animals. He was an angry child. He took a lot of his frustrations out on pets. And then when he was just about 14, 15 years old, he stabbed a six-year-old boy just to see how it felt. He preyed on victims who were vulnerable. Now the six-year-old was vulnerable and later his victims of sex workers, teenage runaways, very, very vulnerable, and Gary took advantage of this, and this was the attraction for Gary. Now it comes to Giselle Lavorne. Giselle was only 17 years old. Gary knew that he almost got caught with that fisherman, or at least I don't know for sure. I'm just assuming. I shouldn't assume, but he now moved to a more wooded area, and that's where he would take his victims. He picked up Giselle, and in Gary's own words, he said, this is going to be an easy kill. She was young. She was pretty. He said, no problem at all. Like I said, during this interview, it is just amazing some of the things that he says, and if you really listen to what he says. It's just so, so disturbing. Gary said that he was more excited to kill her than to actually have sex with her. In this new area that Gary was going to, it was an area that was very secluded. There was airplanes going above this wooded area very often, so he knew that his victim's screams would not be heard. It was very intentional, this area that he had picked. October 1982, a profile was then created of Gary. And in this profile that he was a loner, probably lived with his parents, 30-ish male. And this couldn't have been so far off from who Gary was. Gary had been married. He had a full-time job. He lived in a neighborhood which he maintained friendships with his neighbors. You know, just kind of like a high, but still he was known as a friendly guy. He generally was just the guy next door. At this point in 1982, which was late 1982, Gary said that he started killing a victim every other week. He was taking one every other week. So disturbing. Then it brings us to Linda Rule. Linda was only 16 years old. Gary did something a little bit different with Linda. He ended up catching her hair on fire and when later asked why he did that, he just said that she had beautiful hair and he wanted her to hurt more. Marie Melver, she was 18 years old. Gary picked her up um, the same as he had his other victims, but this time Gary's boyfriend, Pimp, was behind the truck that he had picked up Marie in. This boyfriend is following behind Gary and Gary manages to get away. I think the boyfriend got caught behind a light and so he wasn't able to find them. In this time, he thought that he seen a struggle within the truck. This was the first time that one of the victims that disappeared had been seen. This truck that she was picked up in is now identified. Not by the police yet because he hadn't reported it yet. He waited because, of course, the business that they're in, he didn't really want to report it right away. So he ended up, him and Marie's dad ended up just searching around the neighborhood looking for this truck. They find it. They find it at Gary Ridgeway's house. It's this dead end street in a nicer neighborhood. So they pull up, you know, get the information and go to the police and report it to the police. This is the guy who took Marie. 
So they had a cop go out to his door and the cop knew Gary. They had gone to high school together and they had a conversation. Gary said, oh, no, that wasn't me. I had nothing to do with it. And the cop left and nothing was ever done. And what's sad about this story is that Marie was in the house. She was right a few steps away from this cop, this officer, but because Gary was the guy next door, he just got away with it. He, the cop left. This information wasn't reported to the FBI and Gary wasn't on the radar. He was right there. So Gary, right after high school, ended up joining the US Navy. Gary was deployed to the Philippines. And in the Philippines is where Gary was first introduced to sex workers. In the Philippines, it's a very impoverished country, and so there's a, a lot of sex workers. But honestly, I think there's sex workers everywhere. Anyways, that's not the point. Gary started his hatred for sex workers from being in the military and seeing these sex workers for the first time in the Philippines. And he was said to have contracted both gonorrhea and chlamydia, and so therefore just really didn't like sex workers. And I think that that in combination with that they're just easy prey. But what, what's interesting about Gary and this profile that they put together is that Gary just was an anomaly. Gary, before he was deployed in the Navy, ended up marrying Claudia Barrows. He married her in 1970 and Gary was only 19 years old. Uh, they would only be married for a couple of years and then they divorced. Now, Gary remarried one year later in 1973, and this is when he married Marsha Winslow. Marsha and Gary would be married for seven years and end up having a son together. Marsha was said to have left Gary because he was controlling. He wanted her to be more like his mother, you know, as far as like cooking and cleaning and God knows how else, but he had choked her on a couple of different occasions and uh, Marsha wanted out of the marriage. Gary did not want the marriage to end. He was devastated. And this is when things really escalated for Gary is when he separated from Marsha. Not only did he have the house to himself where he would later have stated he killed 20 to 30 women in his house, but he also didn't have the responsibility of being home with his family and he's hurting. He's hurting at this point. So who does he take it out on and how does he take it out? Gary said that when he killed his victims, it released the hatred for himself and he felt relief for a day. I have no words. This brings us to Gary's eighth victim. Her name was Carol Christensen and she was 21 years old. A little bit about Carol is that she had just recently separated from her husband. She had a little girl. They had nothing, was separated or divorced and didn't have a job. The ex was not providing for them. And so Carol ended up getting a bartending job. And she it seemed like she was trying just to turn her life around and make ends meet for her and her little girl. Well, she met Gary, they went out, you know, three, four times were dating. So she was over at Gary's house. They're having intercourse. She has a double shift that day. And so she, of course, asked Gary, you know, hurry it up. I gotta go. But Gary was hurt by this. And so he ended up killing Carol. He said that it hurt him because she didn't have time for him. And so once again, Gary did something a little bit different with Carol. And what he did with Carol is he ended up getting her dressed, taking her out to the woods, and then placing her body in a posed position. It was her hands crossed. She had a sausage over one hand and a fish a wine bottle, empty wine bottle, and then a paper bag over her head. Gary said it was, she was like garbage to him, but knowing that Gary was a religious man, I'm wondering if this had some religious undertone with the fish and the wine, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say, you never know. He did not say that, so it's hard to say what, what the meaning was, but it did kind of seem like it was just 
garbage to him. She was garbage to him. But when he later talked about her, he teared up and he, he said he cared for her because she was a mother. And so did he care? It's hard to say what he really, he may not care at all. It, you never know, especially with him because he's so convincing. He literally is a master manipulator. So it's really hard to say exactly how, what Gary feels if anything. So rejection was a huge thing, obviously, clearly, for Gary. And so Gary said that he used to fall asleep in his victim's arms and never feel rejected. He wouldn't feel that pain of rejection. This is after he's killed them. He would perform necrophilia, as we all know, he Gary did, or at least now you do, sorry for that. But yeah, he would he would just fall asleep in their arms and say that he didn't feel any rejection from them or wouldn't he didn't have the fear of rejection from them. This brings us to August 18th and it's 1993. Gary's ninth victim was found and her name was Shonda Summers and she was only 16 years old. 10th victim, Gail Matthews, 23 years old. Yvonne Antosh, 19 years old. Constant Known, Neon, 19 years old. And so at this point, we have 12 known bodies. In the meantime, there's several women going missing, several sex workers that have gone missing. The cops, of course, are just putting the warning out there. You know, if you're a sex worker, be careful, be cautious of who you're getting in the car with. So the cops asked Gary, how did you earn the trust of these women? How did you get so many women? And what Gary would do is he would let them in his truck, you know, ask them if they were dating, you know, agree on a price. They would get in the car and then they would ask for his ID. Now, I don't know if this is a normal practice or if this was just something that they were doing, that sex workers were doing to protect themselves at the time. But nevertheless, Gary would show him his ID, but of course he would put his thumb over his name. So that, so if they potentially got away, they wouldn't be able to identify him. So he would show his picture, but then on the other side, you know, it was like a fold out wallet, would be a picture of his son. And with the combination of Gary being cleanly shaven, haircut, uh, you know, clean cut guy, his picture of his son, and then toys of his son placed like on the dash or in the seat. It would give this illusion that these women were safe. And so they would, would trust Gary because everything seemed in order. And this was intentional for Gary. Like I said, he was a master manipulator. Mary Meum, Gary's 14th victim. She was only 18 years old and Mary was eight months pregnant. When the police asked Gary if he knew she was pregnant, he denied it. Eight months pregnant, if you've ever been pregnant, you know at eight months, there's no hiding anything. Gary said he didn't notice. And according to the cops um, who, cause I don't have any pictures, of course, that they said it was clear that you could see that she was pregnant. Like there was no denying it. This brings us to victim number 15, which is Kimmy Kai Pitzer. Uh, Kimmy was only 16 years old and she was found 30 miles outside of Seattle in Auburn. Now, in the meantime, there's all these victims, there's all these missing women. The community is going crazy. They want to know what is going on. What is the police doing? They're holding marches and they're just demanding answers. And of course they were not getting them. And you have to wonder because they were sex workers, was this the police's top priority? Gary had said in one interview that he was controlling these women, these bitches, because the police couldn't. 16th victim is Delise Pager, Plager, uh, 22 years old. 17 is Lisa Yates, 19 years old. Uh, number 18th is a Jane Doe. Number 19th is Cheryl Wims, who's 18 years old. Dolores Williams, 17 years old. Now, the names in the order that I'm going are, are victims that were found. They're finding these bodies and, you know, it's all over the news and it's showing them take the body out of the woods. Now, this would upset Gary. 
Mary. He really felt like these women were his property. He had placed them there. They were his and they were disturbing and taking his, his property. It would anger him that they were disturbing these bodies. It takes a special type of person. By 1985, there now has been 28 bodies. But suddenly, the kidnappings or missing reported and bodies had slowed down significantly, if not stopped for a period of time. Uh, this is when Gary met Judith. Judith was Gary's third wife, you could really tell that Gary had some true feelings for Judith. They had met at a mixer. I don't know. I've heard country buyer. I've heard parents without, what is it? Parents without spouses or something like that. So anyways, it was, it was some type of singles event that they met and they fell in love and Gary slowed down. He didn't stop completely, we'll find out, but it seemed at this point in 1985 that they had stopped. Um, and what's interesting about Judith is that, she, you know, she claimed she knew nothing and I don't believe that any of the police questioned that she knew anything. It didn't seem like it. I mean, she was denying it for him and she was shocked. The neighbors were shocked. Everybody was shocked when Gary got convicted. Judith moved into the same house, into Gary's house that he had committed murders on. He doesn't know how many. He said 20 to 30, but I mean, even just one. She was living in this house where all these women had passed. It's amazing. It's crazy. In mid-1985, there was another body found, and that was uh, Shirley Sherrill, and she was 18 years old. Victim 31, Denise Bush, who was 23 years old. The 32nd victim, Mary West, who was 16 years old. By December of 1985, the count is up to 34 victims. 33 is Chandra Major and 34 is a Jane Doe. We're at four years from the first victim. Four years, 1982 to 1986. Number 35 is found and that's of 19 year old Tracy Winston. Too far after. A lot of these bodies were found in clusters how I wasn't clear on how these bodies did he dump them all at the same time or did he just repeat the same spot I don't know I don't know if that was ever defined or not and then it came to Maureen Feeney who is 19 years old and at this point Gary's not even on the radar we're at 36 victims and he is not even on the radar. Number 37, Kimberly Nelson, 21 years old. Gary drove a maroon pickup. This is really important to the police later, and how this was found out was his potential next victim, who ended up getting away, Rebecca Gardney. How, Gardy? How lucky is Rebecca for getting away? She has no, well, she does now, but at the time she had no idea what she just dodged. Huge bullet. Rebecca fought off Gary and actually won. She literally got away. Um, she was able to do a sketch. She identified his maroon truck. And so what the police did was they compared that to men who had been arrested for solicitation. Basically any arrest, but solicitation as well in that area. And uh, Gary had been arrested in the past for solicitation, picking up a sex worker potentially trying to so he was already arrested so they had his picture Rebecca picked him up from a lineup this was so groundbreaking this was amazing congratulations we finally are at a point where we may catch Gary Ridgway no they tailed Gary they saw that he did some sketchy stuff he would drive by these women on Pacific Highway and just, they said that it looked like he was hunting. They were confident. They got a search warrant because his truck was identified and um, she picked him out of a lineup. So that this was enough so they could get a search warrant for both his house and his truck. They found nothing. I don't even know how that's possible. With Gary's attention to detail as he was said to have both in his job and in the way that he did this, I guess it's not surprising, 
but it is surprising. Even the most detailed person, how do you, how do they not find anything? A piece of jewelry, hair, clothing, blood, nothing. Gary in this time had replaced the bed and he had replaced the carpet, so I guess, but they found nothing. This was 1987. They could have stopped him then, but they, they couldn't. They just didn't have enough for him. And Gary wasn't done killing either. He committed crimes after this search warrant. I find it really interesting that Gary's able to compartmentalize his life in a way that is just, I don't ever wanna call him extraordinary, but the way he was able to compartmentalize was extraordinary. See, he would be able to maintain a full-time job for over 30 years. He had been married three times. None of his exes were on to him. Maybe at one point they were, but nothing, they never reported him and said they ne didn't know. He was able to go to work, get out of work, kill a victim, go home for dinner with his wife, and then kiss his wife and on the weekends his son goodnight. Like how, how do you do that? I don't know. I don't, I, it, he never told anybody. So now we're to 14 years since the search warrant. This brings us to 2001. What happens in 2001? DNA. DNA. The best thing that ever happened in the criminal police justice system is DNA. So as I mentioned earlier, with those two victims that he placed rocks in their vagina, well, um, had sex with them and there was semen behind the rocks. The rocks was protecting that semen. Those rocks, while disturbing as they are, was the best thing that happened for the police to be able to finally put him to rest. Gary was arrested at 52 years old. He had been committing crimes for, not crimes, murders for years, and he was finally caught to DNA evidence. They were able to get both semen and saliva matches. This was huge. In 2003, Gary was said to be the most prolific serial killer um, in the way of body count. Well, uh, others have surpassed him since 2003, but he was convicted on 49 murders that they, the police had evidence to, but he confessed to 71 murders. There could be more. In one interview, he said 71. One, he said 75 to 80. So I don't think we'll ever know how many victims there truly was. I, I don't know if Gary remembers all of them or if he just doesn't want to talk about them or there could have been some that happened during his trip to the Philippines or as a child. So it's hard to say what happened before his serial killings happened. So many lives have been taken because of Gary Ridgway. Um, it's it's terribly, terribly sad. He um, is now 72 and he is in prison. He'll be in prison for the rest of his life. He made a deal with the prosecuting attorney to plead guilty and, and he wouldn't get the death penalty. So he made this deal and in exchange, he did need to help them find bodies, identify victims, and match up missing with, with Gary's killings. With this plea deal, they were able to give some family some peace of mind. You know, with Marie Melvar, they had a birthday cake every year for her, hoping that she would come home. And Gary, after he was convicted, was able to lead them to her body and ease her family's I don't know if it necessarily eases their mind, but it puts them at peace and they were able to lay her body to rest. So there was some upsides to Gary not getting the death penalty, but for this type of person, it's just hard to say. He just isn't worth air, in my opinion. Let me know your thoughts, you guys. You know, what I find interesting is this uh, the cops who just weren't interested in solving these cases because of the types of victims they were, or was it that they really were trying and they just couldn't find, they couldn't catch Gary? I just find it interesting that it was the same road that he picked up his victims. They were all in the same town. How did he never get caught? 82 to 2001. How, how did he never get caught? 
he didn't really change up his strategy. He didn't move states. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts down below. I'd like to start a conversation with you guys. Thank you so much for watching. And if you have any other cases that you'd like me to talk about, please leave it in the comments because I'm looking for ideas. I have a list going of different people I want to talk about, but if you have some suggestions, please send them my way. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye.